and it's another wonderful Monday. We are live on the tracker here on City TV. We took our compass and we went globe trotting. This time we are doing it via Zoom and technology. George Boating is on the tracker uh, today, and he's a former player for Feyenoord, played for Middlesbrough at a point, uh, played for Excelsior also uh, in the Netherlands. So we'll be getting to know him a lot, but we'll be picking his brain on the Premier League these days. He's in the dugout with the notes part doing the coaching. So George uh, is definitely our guest on the show today. George, it's good to have you on the tracker. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Nice. Now, I've always been wondering about your, your origin and your heritage. Talk to me a little bit about where you were born and uh, where you came up and how you ended up uh, almost being, if I would say, a little more Dutch than Ghanaian. <laughs> That, that is what, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in Ghana think that uh, I am more Dutch than Ghanaian. But my heritage is always, has always uh, been there and never changed, really. Mm. Um, to cut a long story short, I was born in, uh, in Koko in Ghana. And then uh, as a little boy, I think at age of eight or nine, my parents uh, uh, took me to Holland for better education. And... Uh, so I had my schooling days of uh, primary and uh, secondary pretty much uh, in Holland. And uh, on sports day, I was discovered. Uh, they said that uh, I look like I have a little bit of a talent. And yeah. uh, finally scouted me, did the trial, I was accepted. And then, uh, yeah, from there on, uh, became professional. Now, just stay on that bit for me a little. Um, I know that the Dutch... Um, teams and their academy systems are practically one of the best in the world. How competitive is it to get into a Fire Nord or an Ajax or one of those academies where you know that once you're a young player who manages to get in there, you are really going to enjoy some quality education? Talk me through that a little. Well, I, you know, your introduction sums up for me because I'm really, really honored and so proud that uh, I've had these two amazing culture in my life uh, number one being ghana mm. uh, i'm really proud ghanaian african man yeah. uh, i love my culture um, there's nothing that you would mention that i don't like of, of what my culture is because it, it also formed me as a human being mm -hmm. um you know and then when i went to holland again the way the system in holland is um, with uh, your education, not only on the football side, but in general in life, yeah. how to be uh, respected and how to respect others, uh, you know, learning how to, you know, run a business, how yeah. to run a football life, a career, all of these things uh, I was taught so well in Holland and which has made me the person that I am today. So I am, I am really proud of both coaches that I have but. Uh, the system in Holland is extremely difficult um, mm. because in Holland, if you are a foreigner, you, you are coming there, they expect you to deliver something that they don't have. So mm. what are you delivering and what can you deliver? What can you add to the team or to the, the business that it can improve uh, what they are doing? So in that case, to break it through as a youngster through the final academy is very, very difficult, extremely difficult, uh, especially those days when I was uh, in my in my era, I would say, uh, because in my era, you had players like Clarence Seedorf, like Edgar Davids, Dennis Bergkamp, Peter Kleibert, uh, Ronald Koeman. That, These are that was players. quite the era. <laughs> that was quite the era, yeah. Those days was, yeah. the Dutch football was... Of, a, of an unkind level. Almost the golden uh, age, you could say that, sort of. Yes, yeah, sort of, because yeah. we, even though we didn't win a lot, <laughs> but we, we kind of like always send the trend of, of how football is supposed to be played. Mm. Now, you speak about proud Ghanaian heritage. How do you feel about not ever getting the chance to play for Ghana? Or, I mean, when it came to that decision moment for you, whether to... Uh, up to play for Ghana, or to play for the Netherlands. What was that time like? Well, let's, you know, I, I, I've actually never really spoken about it in details because um, I felt like people would always understand why uh, not. But let's let's clear one thing here because yeah. a lot of the people back home 
always seems to like find a way to criticize me for not playing for the Black Stars. Mm. But um, you know, it's not like I I didn't want to play for the Black Stars. The opportunity was never there. Um, mm. I heard a, a vague rumor some months ago about people's uh, one one ex player saying that when when I was able to play for Ghana, I turned it down or I never came to play for the Black Stars. That is such an incorrect uh, answer and, and a view of a person that doesn't mm. know the ins and outs. Basically, Ben, um, as a youngster, when I made my debut in final first team, yeah. nobody from the GFA ever, ever came to me or sent a letter to final to express their interest, uh, mm. to say like, George Boateng is one of our players. He was born in Ghana. He's eligible to play for us. Can we please ask him or invite him for a game? Such thing never took place. Never took place. So when I got to 18 and I debutized, yeah. the Dutch national team did that. They invited me to come and play for the under-18s yeah. team, which I did. And up until... Uh, I think I debutized in the first team, senior team of Holland, I think at the age of 25, I think. Yeah. So you can imagine, Ben, between being 18, playing for the under-18s team, yeah. and being 25, how many years of difference is that? Wow. That's like, what, that's seven a, years? That is seven yes. years, right? Yep. If, if my maths don't leave me. Yeah, seven years, exactly. Old. That was a lot of time to have received an invitation. Exactly. And nobody from the GFA ever came to invite me or even come to watch me play or to even speak to my parents because my mom always lived in Ghana. I was mm. in Holland with my dad and we were traveling back and forth. And, and the football is like this, Ben. You as a player, it's not me that have to make the initial approach to the GFA to say, uh, can I come and play for you? It, it never happens that way. Yeah. That is that is the unorthodox way. The professional way is that the federation will send an invite because it's supposed to be an honor for you to be invited to play for your country. So in that seven years, I could have still made my mind up and played for the GFA, hmm. which would have been fantastic, of course, because that particular era, we also had a very good team with the Black Stars, with the likes of Michael Asia and Stephen Appiah, Johnson, and, and so on. Yeah. But those things never, never, never happened. So please, if anyone is listening or watching this show, remember that try not to criticize me for never playing for the Black Stars because they it's not that I didn't play. want to, hmm. but I was never invited to. Interesting. Now, let's talk about Ghana. Once Now we're on the subject. We seem to think down here that we have the talent to win it all in terms of an AFCON. Um, we've made it all the way to a quarterfinal and we're a penalty away from making it to a semifinal uh, to possibly face the Netherlands. That never materialized. But from where you sit, what do you think is still holding us back from winning an AFCON? Because we retrogressed from making the semifinals on a consistent basis to getting knocked out at the round of 16. Well, so... Your your um, your question actually already has an answer in there. What what we have to ask is, why is it that every time we get to semi final and then we don't seem to progress, right? Yeah. So what what is what is the the main reason for that? Is it a fitness? Is it b organization? Is it c planning? Or is it e uh, team effort or or the hard work that needs to be done? Because if you look at semi-finals, they usually de are decided by one goal difference. One mm. nil, yeah. two one, or in some cases, extra time and penalties. So, you know, I haven't managed the national team myself, so I can't really put a finger to what the problem yeah. is unless you are within the camp. Uh, it's very easy to say, oh, well, we didn't play well enough to qualify, but... Um, when you analyze the game, there are always various things that lead to why, the reason why we don't progress. Now, uh, as a coach, you would analyze it from, from the planning, from the organization, yeah. the team selection you've picked, right? your substitutions, the players on the bench. 
did they impact the team when they came on, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et so there's there's so many things that go um, around uh, a semi-final to qualify. What I would say uh, is, um, out of my own experience of playing semi-finals of uh, UEFA Cup, yeah. uh, FA Cup, Carlin Cups, etc., um, the, the the semi-finals are always decided by really small margin, and and it's usually because of the team that the wins usually is a team that makes the less mistakes to qualify. Mm. Um, mm. We certainly have the players. We have good players. There's some uh, extremely talented boys coming up the scene who are, I think, in the next few years would be fantastic to watch. Um, one of them probably will touch on later is Mohamed Kudu. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, the future looks bright, but like I said, we need the whole organization to be in place to be able to succeed. Now, one of the reasons that, one of what the things I believe in personally is that in a team, the members of that team need to have some sort of brotherhood and some sort of chemistry, especially if you want to go all the way and win trophies. I spoke to uh, Black Stars defender Jerry Akamenko, who feels as if Ghana sort of lost the AFCON before we even took off for the competition, based on the fact that there were differences in camp about who should be captain. Kwesi Apia took the captain ban for Masamwa Jan and made Andrea Yu his substantive captain. Jan was yeah. not too happy with that situation and decided to um, retire prematurely until the president had to step in. How do you feel about that situation? Does um, leadership, does team chemistry, does brotherhood form a form of um, winning bond? Does it help teams to win? And is that something Ghana should possibly be looking into? Well, I... I would not uh, criticize uh, the, the former head coach, Kwesi uh, Apia, because, uh, you know, it's, I'm a coach myself, and uh, it's always difficult making decisions. Um, uh, and then going forward, you look back and then you ask yourself always, was it the right one or was it not? So, but what I would say is that um, the way the captaincy was handled is not uh, to criticize the head coach, but I'm talking purely from my point of yeah. view as a coach, is that I would have done it differently. Um, uh, that is the way I am. I, I think different. But having said that, you know, every coach has his own reasons. And I'm sure he has re realized and looked back and asked himself whether it was the right decision to do or not. Um, so that's that. Um, and I also touched on the fact that I feel that it's not just one thing. You are talking about brotherhood, right? Yeah. Uh, team uh, chemistry. Uh, team and that chemistry. Type of stuff, yeah. yeah. So I touched on uh, organization, planning, uh, team selection, yeah. substitutions. So that all, when you talk about brotherhood and and commoderations and uh, you know amongst each other. Um, that is very important, but that all starts from that beginning of what I'm saying, right? So your your organization, your mm -hmm. planning, your team selection. Yeah. Do you yeah. have a plan A, B, and C yeah. in terms of what happens if we go extra time? What happens if there's penalties? So all of these things needs to be considered before you can say uh, we've got a chance. Obviously, it doesn't help when you are going to a huge tournament and. Uh, you've got uh, a few issues still remaining to be solved, i.e. captaincy, who's vice-captain, uh, who's doing that. I think when I touch on planning an organization, I think at least three months prior to the tournament, these things should be all um, sorted out and organized and in place, mm. put it to bed, because there are far more important things as you get closer to the tournament. So this is why I'm saying that as a coach, me, Personally, I would have handled it differently. Um, but that's not to criticize Priscilla Pia for uh, making the decision he did. Because, again, if I was in charge and I would make a certain decision, I am sure that there will always be others who would always question uh, whether it was the right decision or not. This is why football and sports is, is fascinating, because um, we have so many opinions, but yeah. at the end of the day, you as a head coach have to make the right decision. And whether it's 
it's a national team or it's a club team, it, it, you know, the work still remains the same. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, um, talk to me a little bit of, again about making the transition from the plain uh, body or the plain turf to the dugout and uh, what you're doing now as a, as a manager. Uh, how, how easy is it for players to say that, you know what, after I hang up my boots, I, I want to take up this career? How challenging is it? What are the challenges that most players um, need to perhaps see in, in, in sight or foresee before they decide to make that jump? Well, I can only speak for myself, Ben, because um, everyone has a different pathway. Um, yeah. Every person thinks and, and works different. Uh, I can share with you my pathway. When I got to about the age of uh, 34, I realized that I need to start thinking of the next stage of my life and of my career. So I asked the questions, what do I want to do thereafter? Hmm. And because I've been captain for various teams that I've played for, yeah. a captain is usually kind of a, 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 a manager slash leader within the team to organize his players, his friends, and the management. Yeah. So I kind of have already like the leadership skills that is required to be mm. a manager. And uh, I did not fancy the agency part at all or uh, boardroom members or boardroom mm. level. And uh, what, what really I, I enjoy doing is coaching the players and being on the grass working with the boys day in, day out. So that made me decide early on before I retired that I want to be a coach. So then I asked the question is what should I do um, uh, if I want to be a coach, which yeah. is get my licenses. So I started uh, at the age of 35 trying to get my licenses in order. And when I got to 38, I qualified for all the licenses required, uh, UEFA Pro license, yeah. which in total took me three years. And then luckily I had the first uh, opportunity to manage a team in, in Malaysia. Okay. Then I finished playing. So that was a very good experience for me um, to see how management would go. And also it, it kind of like gave me the insight whether I enjoy this. Is, is this really what I want to do? Mm -hmm. and, and I fell in love with the coaching and the management side of the game. So I was delighted to, uh, to qualify for the pro license, which then gave me the opportunity to work back in England. So 2000 and, um, 2018, yeah. uh, I started uh, as an under-13 coach at uh, Blackburn Rovers. And uh, I was coaching the 13s, 14s, 15s, uh, mm. up until the age of under 18. Um, the reason being is because I realized that as a coach, um, and especially as ex-players, yeah. um, a lot of ex-players always think that because they've played for a number of years at a high level, they automatically expect that they will be also a good coach, uh, which yeah. I don't agree with because yeah. I see the coaching and management side as a totally different uh, job. And yes, it helps if you've played at, the, at a good level or you've been pro. It helps because you know a lot of things that goes in and around the organization and planning for, for with the team. But that doesn't necessarily make you a good coach or a good manager. Hmm. So I realized that I have to start uh, low and learn about the job, learn the traits and work my way slowly up. So um, I did that at Blackburn, and then the opportunity came to move to Aston Villa on the 18th, uh, which was last season. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't resist because I played here for, yeah. uh, I think, three years. And uh, the three years were fantastic. So when I got to the on the 18th, I learned a lot again. And uh, since this year, uh, April 2020, I moved up to the second team of Aston Villa, which was... Uh, a fantastic opportunity to work with senior players and another step closer to the goal where I want to be. But I have to say, Ben, a lot of my colleagues and ex-players, ex they don't seem to think the way I think. Uh, a lot of them want and expect that they would go straight into senior football and coach and manage. Now, it, some occasions it, it's good. Uh, some has managed, half managed, sorry. Yeah. But the problem is that because they don't have the education of coaching a long term and the yeah. experience 
of how to develop and man manage players and, and boardrooms and sponsors, etc. What tends to happen then is after a year, they kind of like fail and they fade away. So I'm hoping with the pathway I've chosen yeah. that uh, I would have a bit of foundation and a bit of experience of how to coach, manage uh, at that level. And then hopefully once I get the opportunity to manage a first team level or a yeah. senior level, that I'll be in a much better position than, than others who haven't gone through this pathway. I have three rapid questions for you on leadership and coaching. Real quick, when you were playing um, in your time as captain, who was the most difficult person to manage or who was the most difficult person that teammate that you've had to deal with? Oh, um, well, we, uh, it's not difficult teammate, but they are characters. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, one of the ones that I find it quite hard, not hard, but he was uh, he was challenging to to manage was was Alan Boxic um, because Alan Alan had a different mentality and uh, uh, he was a Croatian striker played yeah. for Lazio Roma and uh, at Middlesbrough as well very good player actually yeah but Alan's Alan's mentality was more like uh, chilled and relaxed he wasn't so adamant on timekeeping and uh, he didn't see any problems in turning up a few minutes later, he was always like, what's the stress? What's the problem? Yeah. <laughs> so that was quite challenging. And the other one I remember was Mido, uh, the Egyptian Mido. Ah, uh, interesting. He was a fantastic player, great left foot, uh, loved playing with him. Um, but yeah, when he came to us, he had a few problems with his, with his fitness and uh, he struggled a little bit, but you could always see the potential that was in him, the talent. Um, but yeah, he was he was really fun guy, and, and we still speak with, to each other uh, now and then. Hmm. Who's the most talented player that you played with? Well, it's hard to describe talent, Ben, because for me, especially now that I'm coaching, yeah, um, a talent you don't want to remain talent uh, all your career because that means you never fulfilled your full hmm. potential. Mm. Um, but uh, I think you mean more like more most uh, successful player you played with, or yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, more like that. Yeah, most successful that I played with. Phew, I, I can pick a lot from the national team. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the one that actually kind of like always stays with me and um, made a huge impression on me of, of how to play football was Patrick Clivert. Um I think. Patrick in his high days, especially when he was at Barcelona, he was unbelievable and, and really such a talented player. But also he was talented, but still fulfilled his full potential by winning trophies at Barcelona and, uh, and so on. Hmm. Let's get into your, give me three pillars of leadership that you cherish most as a coach. Um, Three pillars as leadership. Well, I mean, the word respect comes in mind straight away. <laughs> um, because for me, uh, respecting yourself, respecting the environment, and respecting the coaching staff, yeah. respecting your colleagues, and also really important, you always have to respect the club that you are working for. Um, so that, that word is uh, really important for me yeah. uh, in terms of leadership. And then attitude. Um, do you have the right attitude, the right mindset uh, that every training you are going to give your full 100%? Uh, I want to see that when you come off the pitch, that you could hardly speak to me as a coach because you are breathing still from recovering from, from the game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, if you look at my games, how yeah. I played as before, you will see that it's quite similar as a coach that I demand full 110% yeah. of every player. So, yeah, that is really important. And then one of the things that I really, really find um, important as well in le leadership is your roles and responsibilities that you have as an individual and, and collectively. Um, as an individual, yeah. do you know your job? Do you know how to do it? Do you have all the information that's required? Uh, and then you have to go and, and do it. Your responsibility is, is if you have to be there at that position at that time, that is what you have to do. So those three things, those are responsibility, attitude is really important for me. 
Now, the next question I'm asking you, I'm going to ask you, I I'm not even sure what it's premised on for me, but Louis Van Gaal has always been one of my favorite managers of all time. Down here in Ghana, especially with Manchester United fans, based on how things went with United, they don't seem to think that he's such a great manager. But I'm, I'm asking this because I want to ask about which managers you've always looked up to and who are those guys that have helped you shape your coaching mentality and how you operate as a coach now? Well, every coach has always made an impression on, on me, uh, and I'm sure it will be the same for others. Um, but uh, in my opinion, I've learned from every coach, Ben. Um, I've had good coaches and I've had bad coaches. But the funny thing is, <laughs> yeah, the, the funny thing is that I've learned most from the bad coaches. That is, when I look back, I, I'm like, okay, so how did they solve this and how did they solve that? And then mm. it turns out that the, the bad coaches is, is where I took a lot of information from. And the information I took from them is how not to do it that way, how not to solve the situation that way. Um, the good coaches were always prepared, always had a plan, always were working a month, two to three months ahead of the players. Mm. So they knew exactly what's going to happen, which player they're going to rest, when does the player need rest, when does he need full attention? When yeah. does he need an arm around him? Uh, so all the good coaches had this all in place. Mm. Um, the bad coaches, as an example, then, like you've got as a player, you, you give the, the weekly schedule of what we're going to do. So Monday mm. train, Tuesday train, Wednesday off, Thursday train, Friday train, Saturday game, Sunday off. But if we have a bad result on Saturday, then all of a sudden the coach goes, we are in on Sunday. Hmm. You see? Now, I am not that type of coach at all. Um, once I give a schedule, I try to follow the schedule, and my schedule is not based on the result. It's based on the long term, because I'm working off a curriculum. I'm working off a cycle, which hopefully, uh, in the long term, yeah, we will get more result than short term. Because I don't see the benefit of of uh, because we've lost today and I, as a coach I'm angry so tomorrow we are going to train I don't see the benefit of that is that going to benefit the players next week no it's not because the day that they're supposed to be recovering mm -hmm. now they are working which means that the Monday the day when they come back they're supposed to do the recovery session they are now running 48 hours behind the schedule for next week does that make sense doesn't yeah, but I, I've learned a lot from uh, all the coaches. In particular, Steve McLaren was uh, very instrumental for me in, in his uh, planning and, and training sessions. I learned a lot from uh, Louis van Gaal, even though it was a short term uh, with the national team. Um, but I'm still, I still speak to Louis van Gaal probably once every two months just to catch up and see how he's doing. And of, of course, I pick his brain that's really important for me as well yeah. i, I want to know how he did things and i'm currently actually reading his uh, his autobiography that came out i think a couple of months ago now fantastic so mm. trying to understand but all the coaches I, i've learned a lot then from every coach but george just before we go i mean uh, we need to take our first break but just before we go you're reading the bio you you know the man personally what makes him such a great manager and what has endeared him to win trophies basically everywhere he's gone? Well, the thing is that uh, his, his skills, his man management skills are, are uh, fantastic, really good. But his attention to detail, Ben, that is what makes him different to other coaches. Uh, what I mean with attention to detail <clears throat> is that, uh, as an example, the World Cup in South Africa, right? Louis van Gaal knew his formation, but he also knew that if I have an injury, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to play this formation. And he got lots of success from it. Uh, his attention to detail is, is unbelievable and really, really good. I watched um, uh, a documentary of Louis van Gaal preparing for the World Cup. And uh, this was three months prior 
to the World Cup starting. Yeah. And when we watch the World Cup unfolding and we go back to the documentary that he, that he did, everything that the men presented in the documentary came out as supposed to what he predicted, which is wow. just unbelievable as a, as a human being, but as a coach, to have that kind of knowledge and attention to details makes him such an exceptional coach. Hmm. Well, the conversation is just about getting more interesting. We'll take a break here on the tracker. When we come back, we'll get deeper into uh, the conversation with George Boating uh, here. So keep right here on City TV with us on the tracker. We'll be right back. Tune in to The Point of View this and every Monday and Wednesday at 9 p.m. as I, Bernard Avle, get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. What is the funding that we need? Do we um, actually sit down and leave things as they are? Or should we get more funding so that we can change how we do business as usual? Um, you know, even if you think of geopolitics and geoeconomics, we are entering an age where China wants to build its own internet and uh, we are seeing an, a new arms race, a technological arms race. To be honest with you, it's, it's politics. Uh, there are different dynamics in politics. I'm sure some people didn't give anything, some people gave some. Uh, it depends on, on, on the people you're working with. Remember, The Point of View is live every Monday and Wednesday at 9 p.m. only on City TV. Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Even our bonus data doesn't expire. You the film? Dial star 111 hash to activate now. Etel Tigo. Life is simple. Imagine if you can get all the understanding on some of the difficult subjects you struggle with in school. As a student, do you feel dissatisfied with how hard it is to figure out the subjects you're learning? Or as a parent or guardian, do you worry that your child is struggling to understand some of the subjects in school? Well, now you don't need to sign up for extra lessons or tutors. Simply tune in to Class Act, Mondays to Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. on City TV. Class Act is a show that seeks to enable senior high school students gain a much better understanding of what they learn in school. All you need is a TV, a chair, your notebook, and your pen. Get clarity on subjects such as maths, English, IT, and science. Class Act airs every Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on City TV on DSTV Channel 363 and Go TV Channel 182. Don't forget your pens, pencils, and your notebooks and tune in to Class Act only on City TV. Welcome back to the tracker here on City TV. We are still talking to George Boating, former Netherlands International, now um, with the coaching staff at Aston Villa. George, um, let's now talk about some Ghanaian players who have been making waves um, globally. First up on the list is Thomas Partey. Now, there's been an endless transfer circus around him on whether he's going to make a move to Arsenal, uh, whether the Arsenal move even makes sense for him at his career where he's playing consistently in the Champions League with Atletico Madrid. From where you sit, what makes sense for Thomas to do at this point in his career? Well, first and foremost, I think, I think Thomas has been such a pioneer in, in uh, European football uh, this season. And uh, he's really excelled and uh, has, he has put Ghana uh, unbelievably <coughs> well on the map. So... 
compliment for, for Thomas in that yeah. way. Uh, I, when I watched the game, uh, Liverpool against Atletico Madrid, yeah. Adam I thought he was outstanding. And uh, even the home game, he did really well. And hence why there are there is so much interest from English clubs interested in, uh, in Thomas Party. But uh, there are not many defense, good defensive midfielders around now, and, uh, which has made Thomas a really sought-after player. If you look at the Premier League, how many good defensive midfielders are there? If you look at Fernandinho, you look at uh, Kante, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And then name, name a few more that you think that are fantastic. You've got Fabinho, Fabinho from Liverpool. from Liverpool, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then... I think Abdoulaye Dukour is decent from, from Watford. But he, he's decent, Ben, but he plays more like a number eight and a ten. So True. he's not really a he's six... A defensive player. midfielder, yeah. Yeah, and I like him. He can play that role, Dukour. Uh, but when I watch Watford, he's more like an advanced midfielder going forward. Well, the point I'm trying to make is that the, currently <laughs> I don't see many great defensive midfielders. Like in my time when you had Roy Keane, you had Patrick Vieira, you have Makalele, you have George Boateng, you had yeah. a few, so many, yeah. even Steven Gerrard would play six and he yeah. played fantastically well. So Thomas is at this moment in time, I think whichever team in Europe that will get Thomas party next season would have a, a very well balanced midfielder because you can, you can pretty much put any player next to him <coughs> Yeah. And and that player can excel because of Thomas. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me, uh, because I read in the papers as well that Atletico Madrid is interested and in looking to break his contract open and uh, extend his contract. It would be a wise decision <laughs> for Atletico Madrid to do. I, I compare this situation a little bit like when Yaya Toure was at uh, uh, Barcelona and, and Yaya was actually one of the best players. Yaya wanted to stay, but he wanted a better contract to be on par with other players uh, who are earning uh, a lot more than he was. Mm -hmm. um, and at this moment, with Thomas Partey, I think if Atletico Madrid would give him what he wants <coughs> and keep him, it would benefit them. But if they underestimate how good Thomas Partey is and has been for the team and he leaves, then they will, we will see a similar kind of... A, situation of what Yaya Toure had at Barcelona and when he left to go to Manchester City. Mm. Now, tell me about suitability to a Premier League suitor, for instance. Arsenal are the ones, obviously, who have shown their hand so far. Um, I feel as if he can go one better and play for maybe even a Manchester United or a Manchester City if they do show interest. How do you feel about how he meshes with the, the big guns in the Premier League generally? Well, I, I see what you are saying, Ben, because at the moment, Arsenal, it looks like Arsenal is not going to qualify for the Champions League. And uh, Arteta is building a new, a new team. So it might take maybe a, a couple of years before yeah. uh, Arsenal will start again competing with the top four and winning trophies. But that doesn't say that it's a fantastic club, all right? And they've got a good manager with good assistant coaches there now. So I, I can see Arsenal getting better and better. But it will obviously not be immediately because it takes time to yeah. build a good team, right? And if you look at the situation at Manchester City, they've always been looking for a replacement for Fernandinho. So it, it would be quite a good decision if Manchester City does show interest in Thomas Partey. And that would be a, a fantastic place for him to play. If we look at Manchester United's situation, that's even more suitable because Manchester United doesn't have an in and out number six. Yes, McTominay has been playing there sometimes. Uh, you know Pogba can play as a six, but I think Pogba in a three-man uh, midfield is a much better player as the eight, as how they've been playing currently with Fernandez going more as the ten yeah. and Paul Pogba as the eight. Can they have someone like Thomas Partey to sit there and control the midfield and lead the midfield, allow the players like uh, Paul Pogba and Fernandes to then go forward? I think Manchester United would then probably start playing to win the league. Hmm.
that's some really uh, good encouragement there. Let's stay with the Premier League boys. Let's now talk about one guy whose situation sort of makes me sad. It's Barbaraman of Chelsea. So he's been all around. He's been to Mets. He's been to uh, the Spanish uh, La Liga. He's been to the German Bundesliga, played with Schalke. Now he's back with Chelsea, who are his parent club. This is basically, um, it's been difficult for him because he suffered the ACL injury when he came down to play in the AFCON for Ghana. The consensus when he was given his short stretch at the beginning of his Chelsea career was the fact that he wasn't good enough to be playing at the highest level. A lot of people felt like that. I thought otherwise. But now his situation is a lot more uncertain because he's come back to the club and the club has a new manager. But how do you see the Barbara Man situation progressing? And if you could say a few words to him as a young man, what, what would you tell him? Well, it's an unfortunate situation because when you... Um have an injury like that with the ACL, it always seems to affect every player, every person, because it's not easy. It's a, a very high-risk injury, but he came back and uh, he's playing, he's fit again. Yeah. Um, all I can say is that being at Chelsea with under Frank Lampard now, they seem to more giving players of younger age a chance to play. Yeah. So, he, he, first and foremost, I would say join the preseason, join them. See if you can work your way into the squad and, and prove yourself during preseason. Because you yeah. see now young players like Hudson or Doy, they yeah. will get a chance. They will play, right? So he would also have an opportunity. But if he feels like he's done the preseason, he's fully fit, and he feels that after a conversation with Frank Lampard, there is no opportunity for him to, to play, then I would probably seek for another loan deal. But at the moment, I would say, Try and stay there, join pre-season with Chelsea and, and prove yourself. Make sure you prove yourself that, A, you are fit and re fully recovered from the ACL and you are playing free and fight for a place. But fighting for a place, Ben, you cannot fight for a place in six weeks. <laughs> this is sometimes yeah. two, three months where you have to really dig in and work your socks off to get the opportunity. Sometimes you have to sit there for three months and just wait for one appearance and show what you can do. Um, but that is the best advice I could give him at the moment. Talk to me also about Jordan Ayew. Now, he is Ghana's all-time top scorer in the Premier League now. It's such a big achievement for him. Um, he's, he's doing well with Crystal Palace this season. If you watch him as a player, in which areas can he get better? I love Jordan, I, and I love watching him, honestly. I, I think we are... We are not uh, so blessed, uh, uh, you know, in the in the attacking department for the national team yeah. of the Black, Black Stars. But I think Jordan leads the line very well. And he's at a very good age. And he's scoring goals for Crystal Palace. Um, why I love watching Jordan is because when you see how hard he works and how he creates the goals, the goals that he creates... He created the goals mostly by himself. Mm -hmm. I think one goal that he scored in the last six was an assist that came from a cutback from uh, Van Arnold. Yeah. Apart from that, every goal he scored is either from an individual uh, creativity or brilliance that he scored, which tells me that he, he should play for a bigger team. He's good enough to play for a bigger team. Because when you can create goals in such a difficult team yeah. that is always, not always struggling, but... Um, not blessed with many chances in a game, mm -hmm. that means that he's quite prolific. If you play for Liverpool as a as a nine, you know that you will get maybe three, four good opportunities in a game. Yeah. Then you can take one. But if you're playing for Crystal Palace, you might get in 90 minutes only just one opportunity, and you have to take it. This is why I'm so pleased and, and, and almost use... I can use the word proud for Jordan because yeah. he, he's done ever so well in, in such a tough tough, tough league with a difficult team. Hmm. That takes the conversation on to the kid on the block now, Mohamed Kudus. Um, I'm not sure how many players Ajax treat in that manner when they sign them, but it looks like there's a whole fanfare around him. The club treating him like a star player already. Is that what typically happens? They, they, they get everybody on the socials and stuff like that, or... They do this type of stuff for players they sort of think have some special something coming in. I think the latter one. 
I think uh, Mohammed is uh, is at a very good age, 19 years of age, and uh, he's got amazing left foot. Um, he, he can dribble, he can beat players, he can score goals, yeah. he can assist goals. Um, when I watched him play, I thought, this is a player that if he gets the right coach at hand and can yeah. guide him and give him a lot more knowledge about the game, yeah. I think he'll be an amazing player um, for, for the Black Stars and for Ajax. Um, we look at uh, Andre Ayu now. Andre is... Uh, He's our captain. He's doing really well. Yeah. But he may also have maybe three years in him to play for the national team. And then he needs to be replaced. Someone like Mohamed Kudus could be someone to, to step into the footsteps of Jordan. Oh, sorry, of Andre mm. um, for the national team. Regarding Ajax, I think the reason why Holland and Ajax is bringing him this way is because they can see what I've seen. He's got such a huge potential and, and mm. what a talent to, to, to have amongst uh, the squad. With Ziyech being uh, sold to Chelsea, which would now kind of like they were looking for a similar player like Ziyech yeah. and found Mohamed Kudus. So that says a lot. With, with Ziyech going to Chelsea for such a, a huge fee and he's played some good Champions League games, won yeah. titles in Holland. So for Mohamed Kudus to step into that field, tells her and says a lot about the qualities that Ajax have, the quality that Ajax has brought in-house. I just hope that um, he settles down quickly um, because Holland um, is not, uh, uh, how do I say it, Holland, the culture is different. Um, you know, everyone speaks English, so that helps. But yeah. you have to try and understand the culture of football, which is a lot possession-based. Uh, you can't give the ball away no matter what. You have to be patient, build up. The ball is always going fast, even though you are not running. Yeah. So he has to get the culture of the football really quick because it will be totally different to uh, Norgeland where he came from. Um, but he's got certainly he's got the talent and he's got the attributes to be a, a successful and a huge star for, for club and country. Hmm. Now, you've been down here in Ghana. I'm sure you've looked at uh, the football infrastructure somewhat. You've seen the players that have come out of here. And now we, we are all talking about Mohamed Kudus. What do you think we need to do a little better to ensure that we can have, I mean, a steady stream of talent like that coming out of this place onto the global stage? Well, I think that's where um, the coaches are so important because... The players, the talent are there in Ghana. Mm -hmm. But if you are not going to educate them properly in terms of coaching-wise, then talent will always go to waste. Uh, I mm -hmm. compare it always with a very, very highly uh, IQ student. If the, the student is, uh, is, is a good student and has high IQ, you still have to put him through the maths questions and the biological questions and da-da-da-da-da to get the IQ out of him. And yeah. it's the same with the players. If we've got enough talent, right? So the, the coaches that are coaching the players mm -hmm. have to know how to coach the players and not every day just play 11v11 or 5v5 every day. Yeah. No, you have to know that coaching these boys, they need technical drills, right? They need possession games. Yeah. They need passing drills and they need game time. So you, it, it's a blend of developing good, talented players to get them to be able to express themselves so that there will be more interest in, in them from overseas. So the coaching part, the coaching aspect in, in Ghana is, is such so vital for development of Ghana football that people should not underestimate that. It's not always about the game. We are, we are easy to criticize players to say, oh, but he didn't play well, he didn't do that. Well, he doesn't do it because he hasn't been told to do it. Or, yeah. you know, so nobody told him or nobody expressed him or, or thought him like, this is how to solve it. This is what to do in this position. Yeah. So it's very important what kind of coach uh, we have, the coaches we have in the local leagues. And can they try and go abroad, do more work experience, go to co uh, other clubs, see how they coach players, mm -hmm. spend a week there. And, and learn about coaching and development so that when you go back, you can pass on these kind of messages to the local talent. Hmm. Now, 
let's let's move the conversation on to something else. And um, the game these days is very different. Playing behind closed doors, having to uh, improvise on a lot of technology because of COVID-19. From a coaching standpoint and from somebody who's seen the game from the early 90s till now, what are some of the lessons that this COVID-19 pandemic has taught you in terms of uh, moving forward with the game, changes that you think we should adopt going forward, and basically the lessons you've picked out of it? Well, I'm sure it would have been a very tricky and difficult situation for every club, every coach. Um, we've had to develop a whole new home program for the boys because yeah. you found as a coach think that, oh, well, it's, it's COVID-19, so um, we can't do anything. We sit home all day and the players will just eat, eat, eat and become fat. Uh, that that was not going to go yeah. down very well. So we, uh, as Aston Villa, we developed a home program for the players, whereby they they we were allowed uh, under government guidance that uh, and guidelines that we were able to do one day, sorry, one time a day, uh, some form of a workout outside. So as a club, uh, we make use of that, and uh, the boys then went out and they had their GPSs with them. And uh, they did the, the, the session on their own, keeping the social distances and uh, everything under government guidelines. So, yeah, as a coach, I learned how to still interact with players, even though we were under such a, a difficult and strange time to try and keep the boys still active mm -hmm. and engaged. Uh, we did a lot of online uh, work, a lot of analysis work online, learning about the game. Uh, the boys were then picking up games yeah. and we analysed them, talked them through their positions. Uh, and so we kept ourselves busy that way. But uh, it's been trying times and I'm just yeah. delighted that we are not far off from uh, getting back to real action. Hmm. Let's talk about some quick off-the-pitch stuff to just round the interview up. Now, uh, just from the interview, I gleaned that you were a reading man. Share with me your three most impactful books or books you would recommend for our viewers, myself, anybody out there uh, watching? Oh, uh, then I need to get my, my phone with me because I've, I've, read, I've read a few, actually. Yeah. Um, well, I, at the moment, I'm sure everybody has seen it with uh, Michael Jordan's documentary, which... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a I, big basketball fan, so I, I definitely yeah. was into that. Yeah, that, that was uh, fantastic to watch. I think Andre Agassi's autobiography is also one to, to read. Phenomenal, uh, lots of inspiration stories there, which I, I, I really enjoyed. Yeah. And uh, recently I started, uh, no, actually I finished it. I finished Wesley Snyder's book, which came out uh, a few months ago. Uh, also some interesting stories about yeah. uh, his preparation for Champions League games and uh, winning trophies and his time at Real Madrid. Um, I, I like, Ben, I like to kind of like uh, read about what made others so good and what did they do differently because I'm constantly looking at how can I be better? Yeah. What can I, what message or what can I do to to help myself get to the next level and to, to become a better coach? Uh, at the moment, I like to read more uh, leadership and inspiring books and about coaches because that is where I'm going. So, but I'm, I'm always open for a good book of an ex-player that is interesting. Fantastic. I mean, whilst you're on to that, Michael Jordan and that stuff, you can check out 11 Rings by Phil Jackson. It's a fantastic book, especially from where you are as a manager. I think you would love it. Brilliant. I'll, I'll, I'll put that on my list. Yeah. Finally, okay. finally, finally, before you go, tell me about your favorite Ghanaian meals. <laughs> wow. Uh, well... The, my mom says that I was always a Banku guy, you know. Bang, I love Banku. <laughs> uh, but, you know, being a Santi man, I, I can't go away from a nice light soup with fufu. So that, those two meals you can actually wake me up uh, at night for and, and to come and enjoy some nice home-cooked home food. Man, if you're waking up at night to enjoy Banku and Fufu, you definitely aren't going back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, George. It's been uh, absolutely amazing sharing um, insights with you and uh, just speaking to you uh, on the tracker. Hopefully, some other time we can catch up and then we can talk some more.
My pleasure, Ben. And I wish everyone in Ghana a fantastic and stay safe, be safe. Yeah, you be safe out there too. Thank you. Yes, so you heard the man there, George Boateng, uh, coming to us all the way from the United Kingdom with the Aston Villa coaching staff, played for uh, Middlesbrough, played for Aston Villa, played for Feyenoord. These days, he's in the dugout doing his thing. Same time next week, the tracker will be back on City TV.